can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, Uri, I like to point people to other episodes, right? So, um, Moise Navone of Mobileye talks about the Mobileye's journey, which I'm sure you know, um, being acquired for by Intel for $13.2 billion. But what struck me with the story was not that, which is amazing, but that at one point he just had to sacrifice and the, he had to take a pay cut and he had to go back to his family and his kids and tell them we're pulling you out of all extracurriculars and no more eating out because the up and down of his journey, right? Even in the mobile eye journey. And uh, he talks about the mobile eye journey is kind of like the people of Israel journey, which we're going to talk about before I introduce uh, Uri in a second, who has got the book, The Unstoppable Startup, which I'll properly introduce. Um, there's also another one you should check out um, by, by my friend Sweet Process, Robert Sutton. Robert Sutton is a professor of management, science, engineering, co-founder of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and Institute of Design. Check that out on uh, Sweet Process. It'll be on Inspired Insider too. Um, and I'm going to, I'm excited to talk about the unstoppable startup. Any startup, any business, you know, or he wants to be unstoppable and have the pieces and you've have um, we'll say, I don't know the recipe, but sort of the recipe. And we'll, I'll introduce that in a second. Before I do, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Rise25 is the business which I co-founded with, my, uh, with John Corcoran. And we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients. And what we do is we help you run your podcast. Um, and it's the number one thing already for me is in life is relationships. And I'm always looking at how do I give to my best relationships. And a podcast has allowed me to profile other people's thought leadership and their companies and give to them as much as I can. Um, so if you're interested in starting a podcast, go to rise25.com, check it out. Um, there's a couple of videos of myself and my business partner bantering like an old married couple and check it out. Um, and, you know, Uri, before we got started, you said, you know, on my about page of Inspired Insider is actually a video of my grandfather who inspired me to podcast. And um, he's a Holocaust survivor and his legacy lives on because of an interview, because of an interview that was done by the Holocaust Foundation. So, yes, I think it's been the best thing for my life to do a podcast. But really, I think of we're helping each other leave a legacy beyond ourselves with this um, content. So, Check it out, rise25.com. And I want to introduce today's guest. Um, Uri Adoni is author of The Unstoppable Startup. And after spending 20 years in high tech and over 12, year, 12 years of partner at Jerusalem Venture Partners, Media Labs, he decided to write the book. The, the book is called The Unstoppable Startup, Mastering Israel's Secret Rules of Chutzpah. And he wanted to share the secrets to Israel's incredible track record of success. And just to give you an idea of Jerusalem Venture Partners, they had over 12 IPOs, over 30 million, or 30 M&As, an exit value of over $20 billion. And he actually goes behind the scenes in this book to explain the principles and practices that can make any startup anywhere in the world an unstoppable one. And so if you know the stats, more than half of startups fail. So... How do you limit that? How do you get over that? And if you study Israel, Israel stands out because even though it's a really small country, population of over 9 million, Israel has one of the highest concentrations of startups in the world and venture capital per capita is one of the top countries in terms of the number of com companies listed on NASDAQ and many more. So, Uri, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I want to start with, I always like to start and talk about struggle, okay? And there's two things, right? And um, you were, we were talking a little bit before we hit record about Holocaust survivors and your family. And then the second is what creates this grit, this chutzpah, and we were talking about Israeli army. So why don't you start with um, Israeli army and what that, what that influence has been on you? Sure. Um... 
I think that uh, one of the things that uh, some people think about when they think about armies as a whole is that, you know, there's order and the most important thing is to just to follow the orders. And in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, it's actually not the most important thing. Um, the most important thing in the Israeli army is to complete the mission. That's it. Uh, you can improvise, you can change the plan, you can do whatever you want. And uh, as a commander of a combat unit, uh, you are being trained to actually improvise and solve all sorts of issues that are coming because usually the plan don't, the life don't go according to the plan. Uh, and when you find yourself in a hostile uh, territory or in some, in some kind of operation or in some kind of a fight, uh, you're kind of the commander on the ground and you're expected first and foremost to complete the mission. You can do whatever you want in order to do that. And, uh, and, and so I think that kind of a mindset is very powerful. And when, uh, and, you know, most, almost all Israelis are going through the army and uh, so you get this kind of uh, mindset in a very early age, like when you're 18, 19. And when you take this kind of mindset into you know, the business side, and especially for startups, which is always kind of uh, some kind of a struggle, some kind of a high competition. Uh, obviously, it's not a war, but it's a, it's a tense uh, situation. Uh, this kind of mission completion um, mindset is very, very powerful. And I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, also behind the success of the Israeli startup, uh, startup nation, so to speak. What um, are you, sticks out to you in Israeli army story that sticks out to you either from someone's told you or your personal experience? Um, <laughs> I think that... Uh, I think that mainly, I would say, you know, without going into too many details, but uh, when you're in a, in a hostile territory uh, outside of Israel and you're on a mission and you get all sorts of uh, un, uh, unplanned uh, situations, and it can be various manners, you know, you can wait for a hop helicopter to pick you up and you cannot land because of weather and that wasn't as anticipated or, uh, you know, you know, one of the soldiers uh, is wounded or uh, a one way that you thought to go through is blocked and you didn't realize it through the maps or whatever. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a tense situation. Uh, and maybe I would say to the extreme when you're, when you're under fire, which is very frightening. Uh, and anybody who will tell you is not frightened, I, I, I would find it hard to believe. But even though you are in these situations, you learn how to um, how to operate, how to kind of push the sphere aside to control it and make sure you're kind of making the right decisions. And you know, obviously, lives lives are depends on that. And you want to make sure that the soldiers and you know the soldiers are actually counting you. Nobody will charge into fire just because you have some ranks on your shoulders. They will run after you because they believe that you are making the right decisions. So I think that making decisions under pressure, and uh, it could be physical pressure, it could be mental pressure, it could be both. I think probably that's kind of the main takeaway that I would take from these situations. And when you take, you know, when, when you're relatively young, you know, you're in the early 20s when you're in these situations, it actually gives, um, I think, a good experience um, and the, the good kind of um, proportions uh, to things. Uh, and so that's the main takeaway. What um, are, you know, you are, you know, with uh, Jerusalem Venture Partners, uh, what made you decide to write this book? You're probably, you have all these startups coming to you, you know, you know, they're, they're kind of like, okay, like, I would love to have you invest in our company. And what made you decide to decide, oh, I need to write this book? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the ratio of investment per deal flow is very low. So usually it's around one to 100. So you see 100 companies and you invest in one. That's more or less the, the, the statistics. Um, and in a way, when you're in venture capital, so you, you, have, you have to say no in many cases. And one of the things that uh, 
kind of, uh, it's kind of, a, I would say, a, a strategy, so to speak. I think that anybody who meets you, uh, you need to give them something back, not only to hear. And even if you say no in terms of investment, you need to either, you know, make a good connection, give them some advice, you know, maybe uh, have some an alternative strategic direction to what they're doing if you have anything to give. But you should give them something because in many cases you have the experience for that. And in a way, the, the book is some kind of a way to kind of um, um, share the knowledge and the experience um, with other entrepreneurs. So, you know, the, the, the statistics uh, that you mentioned earlier in the uh, earlier on about, you know, that most startups fail will be, um, you know, for a startup will be not as uh, crucial or not as uh, cruel, I would say. Um, so in a way, uh, to hire the, or to increase the, 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 the chances to start. And I think that uh, there are things that when you maybe follow them or getting into the right mindset can help to help you to increase the chances of your startup of being on the winning end rather on the, on the losing end. Yeah. I mean, I know writing a book and, and doing, going through that process is a serious undertaking and you're already busy as it is. Um, I want to talk about some of your favorite stories from the book. Um, one that sticks out to me in the book is the story of um, Psyactive. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's a, I think it's a, one of the things I did in the book. I didn't just take the big names and the famous uh, companies, but actually wanted to show that uh, companies that maybe some of the audience never heard of had a great story behind it and a great way of uh, kind of uh, explaining what Futspa is, because it's hard to just, the best way to kind of uh, describe Futspa is to show, don't tell about it. So um, I, the, the story of Cyactive is, uh, is interesting because uh, what they did was, uh, you know, without going into too much technology, but uh, when you talk about antiviruses, the way the world works is that you have a few existing viruses that most hackers actually take and change something within the virus, and then they create an, a new virus. So if you have an antivirus that blocks one virus, it wouldn't block the mutation of the virus. So they don't have to write the whole virus from scratch. This is talking about 97, 98% of the viruses in the world. It's mutations of existing ones. So what they thought, and it's kind of a cat and mouse thing, because for every, every, every um, virus that comes to life, uh, you need to kind of create this antivirus thing. So uh, what they thought, they said, you know what, let's, let's look at it from a completely different angle. And uh, they, they came up with this idea uh, that actually comes from biology and say, you know what, let's, uh, like a vaccine, so to speak, let's, let's take a virus, uh, create an algorithm that will create automatically tens of thousands of potential mutations of this virus. And then we can create a block that actually blocks all the mutations before they even ever existed. Hmm. So they kind of turned this, uh, this pyramid on the head in a way, because now the hacker would find it much hard to change a virus because it already has this vaccine, so to speak, or yeah. this uh, the ultimate antivirus. And so, uh, and, and, and they proved it in a nice way. So the company was founded in, to, uh, 2013, but they took a virus from 2007, ran the magic on it, and showed that another virus that was published in 2010, they would actually re found it already in 2007. So they actually demonstrated that this technology works, uh, and uh, and and so I thought it's uh, you know eventually PayPal bought them uh, relatively quick because they understood the power of this technology, but the idea of uh, challenging the reality as it is, or the reality of antiviruses, and kind of thinking completely in a different manner, I thought it's a great kind of, a, you know, great example of what chutzpah is, because it really demonstrates the mindset that you have in order to kind of challenge the status quo and say, you know what, I have the chutzpah or the audacity or, or you know, I'm, I'm bold enough to challenge it and come up with a different solution. And I think, you know, the the core of chutzpah, I would say, is is this this mindset, uh, and I thought that uh, that's a great 
example of uh, showing what it is. How do you describe chutzpah to someone who has no idea what that is? And it's a funny thing when I try and when I find myself explaining it to someone, you know, I use the same word to describe it, which does not work. Chutzpah, you know, it's like you have chutzpah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I think chutzpah in a way, I, I think to be very honest, it has a negative sign and a positive side. So when yeah. you say in Israel, this guy has chutzpah, it can be, oh, he's very rude and he's arrogant, and this is not what I'm talking about. Or he has, oh, he or she, uh, they have the nerve, they have the ball, they have the audacity to go and, you know, address something that, uh, or challenge something that is, uh, looks like uh, unaddressable. Uh, and I'm obviously referring to the, to the, la- uh, to the latter. So um, in a way, I would say chutzpah is, uh, is not accepting, uh, may, maybe not accepting reality as it is. Um, and that's is kind of the mindset of, of chutzpah. Uh, there is also a way of doing business, which is very um, straightforward, telling what you think, you know, not kind of being too many, too, too much, uh, you know, around the bush, but actually saying what you think and being very direct about it. Again, without crossing the line of being arrogant or rude. And, uh, and also, and, and that's part of the interaction with people. So in a way, it's all the way from... Uh, your mindset, how you look at the world, how, how uh, confident you are in your idea, or your company, or yourself to challenge the status quo and challenge the reality, all the way to how you do business and how you interact with people. So, was SciActive, or was SciActive one of the investments from JVP? Yeah, uh, yeah it was uh, part of uh, JVP's investments, and it was... Uh, Actually, it was the first investment of uh, JVP Media uh, uh, as CyberLab, sorry, in the, in the south of Israel, in Bel Sheva, and uh, it was uh, acquired relatively quick, uh, less, than, less than two years, and it was acquired because it has that very powerful technology behind it. So, you, you know, SciActive comes to you, you know, you reject 100 and you accept one. What did JVP see in this? that allowed to say yes, as opposed to the other hundred, which some of them may have looked really good too. Yeah, so I think that uh, when we look, uh, and that would be you know, relevant to SciActive and other companies that we invested in, but I think overall, if you need to summarize, there are three main things that we look at a team and definitely SciActive had them all. Uh, the first one is the team. And uh, when you look at the team, uh, you look for not only very strong technological background, which is important, but you look for, uh, you know, kind of a combination between technology, business, so you want to have a few disciplines within the team. Uh, But I think mainly, I think the main thing that we're looking at on top of the experience is the passion behind the team and the passion that drives the team. And uh, you wouldn't like an entrepreneur to be passionate about the exit or about making money. I mean, that's fine. I mean, if there is an exit event, eventually it's good, and obviously that's our business model. But you want the entrepreneur to have a passion to change the space that they're uh, operating in. You want them to really be uh, passionate about changing the status quo, or the reality, as I mentioned. So passion is very important. And by the way, passion is very hard to um, uh, measure. No, to fake. Oh, to uh, fake. Also to measure, by the way. So, you know, when you see, you know, you know when it's there or when it's not there. Uh, but it's also hard to measure. So it's a very intuitive thing, which is a good point you made. I think that it's not, it's not an Excel sheet. It's something that you feel. And you, it's like, a, you know, one of these uh, American Idol things that you feel that somebody's a good singer. You don't know why, but you feel yeah. they're good. So it's a very similar thing that we're looking at in a team. Uh, yeah. The second thing we're looking at is the market they're operating in. And, um, and the market should be, you know, a growing market, uh, but not too saturated in terms of, uh, of other companies. It has, the company has to have the potential to become a category leader. And for that, it usually needs to have some kind of uh, a concept that would disrupt the market. Because if it's already existed, maybe there's other, probably there's other leaders to the category. So uh, a, a growing market and a potential kind of new, maybe subcategory to a market or even a 
a new category of a market. That's a, it's an important uh, kind of thing. And the third thing we're looking at is the product itself, uh, mainly the technology, but not only. So we want to have some kind of a competitive advantage. If there is some a deep technology, it's definitely in a, a plus. Uh, but the, you know, it can be on the business model, it can be in the distribution channels, it can be on the partnership they have. So uh, anything that you have within the product that actually makes it better than the existing solutions in the market uh, is very important for us. What, you know, or would you say, what are some Israeli companies that um, maybe people don't know came out of Israel, but they're actually really well known? Like Waze would be one I, I think of off the top of my head. Yeah, so Waze is, uh, I think Waze is a great example because a lot of people, when I tell them Waze is actually an Israeli company, they said, oh, really? I didn't realize that. Uh, well, it's not anymore. It was bought by, by Google for over a billion dollars, but uh, it was originated and, and founded in, uh, uh, in Israel. Uh, I think, again, it's a great, it's a great story of uh, and, and a couple of entrepreneurs, and one of them, Uri Levin, which I interviewed in the book as well, is a great entrepreneur. And uh, one of the things that is interesting about the story is that when they kind of came to that, a lot of people, most people that they've met said to them, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hold on. You know, there's so many GPSs, there's Google Maps. How, how, how on earth do you think like a small startup in Israel would win such a big category as, as, the, uh, as the navigation category and uh, the GPS? And they said, you know, because there is a, there is a the mark, there is, a, there is an opportunity. There's a flaw in the market. And the flaw is that when I use a GPS, I only know of a, mark, uh, of a traffic jam when I'm in it. And that's obviously too late. <laughs> and I need to know about the traffic jam before I get there. And I'm right. not necessarily more interested in the shorter route. I'm interested in the shorter time uh, or, or estimated time of arrival, FTA, uh, EPA. It goes and back so into the Israeli can... army, you know, complete the mission, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Like, who cares yeah. how I get there? Exactly. I need to get there. I don't care how. Exactly. So, uh, um, and they believe that uh, uh, sharing content and sharing your uh, location would actually s enable them to create this unique uh, map that will give this competitive advantage that nobody has of the traffic jams uh, in your city and not just the routes. Uh, and again, their hypothesis was, yeah, we will create something better than Google Bay and the other uh, GPS out there. Many people were skeptical. Uh, I would say in brackets, if you have a revolutionary idea, you will get a lot of skeptical people saying, you know, it wouldn't work. And if, I, if everybody thinks it's a good idea, maybe it's not that revolutionary. Uh, and uh, so they, they had their struggle. They, it wasn't a smooth ride uh, like any startup. It's a roller coaster. Uh, but they have proved that people actually willing to share their location and uh, have this kind of uh, uh, common uh, created map in real time that enables you to uh, uh, arrive in a, in a shorter time to your destination. And even though, you know, the exit story is great, but I think the journey that they had of creating the map, of testing uh, their, uh, their technology, uh, of understanding, you know, one of the interesting uh, things that Uri said, you know, don't interview the people who stays and like your, your technology or your product. Uh, interview the one who actually deserted it or, or, or didn't like it because they're, they're going to give you some feedback why they didn't stay with, with the, with the mm. product. And you can learn quite a lot from that. So, you know, even though it's good to hear your clients and it's important thing to listen to your clients, it's sometimes even more uh, uh, beneficial to hear yeah. to your ex clients <laughs> because they would yeah. give you they would give you some uh, data points or insights that the existing client wouldn't necessarily have. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, if you really want to improve, interview your, the people who abandoned it and didn't like it. Exactly. Um, What's another company from Israel that is known that most people don't know is Israeli company? Um, 
I think I don't know. It's 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 well known in the in the cyber security. Um, it's called CyberArk. It's a company that uh, it went public on Nasdaq uh, a few years back. And I think the interesting thing about CyberArk is that they're probably the first company that came and said um, that there is also enemies from within and not only from the outside. Uh, so, you know, when Checkpoint came out with, uh, with their firewall, which, uh, by the way, it's a great metaphor. And I think that, again, in brackets, I would say, if you're a startup, you have a great, if you have a great metaphor, it really helps. Um, so they had this idea of uh, a firewall, which actually kind of uh, visualizes what they do. They kind of blocks enemies uh, from uh, outside. And what CyberArk did is actually said, you know what? If somebody has, they, you, enemies don't necessarily have to penetrate from outside. They can come from within the company. And they were the first one that actually uh, kind of protected the organization from people within the organization that have access to data. Uh, one of the interesting timings is just before their IPO on ASDAQ in 2014, there was the whole uh, Snowden uh, incident. And actually, they had a, some kind of a PR of what happens that somebody who's not or uh, is not authorized actually uh, have access to data and information that they shouldn't have. And uh, this is exactly what they're doing. So in a way, they kind of disrupted the market in a different manner, saying, you know, enemies can be with, from within. And actually, statistics show that uh, enemies are coming from within. By the way, from within, it doesn't have to be that the employee necessarily is the one who is hacking, but a, a, an external hacker can use uh, uh, an access from, if, if you know, they penetrate an employee's computer, then they're within. So um, mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, they kind of came with this concept that proved to be very, very uh, powerful one. And, and again, because it's on NASDAQ and, uh, and many companies use it, uh, a lot of uh, Fortune 500, but not many people know that actually the origin of cy cyber arc is actually Israel. Yeah, I love that. That's, I mean, there's so many army, you know, metaphors there, defense force metaphors. Um, I'm curious, you know, like you said, with, with this, the life of a startup, you're trying to find, you know, product market fit, you're trying to find all these things and they have to probably iterate along the way. What's, a, what's one of the a businesses that you think of that sticks out, whether you had investment or not with them, that they had a major pivot that allowed them to have a breakthrough? Like when I was talking to Mobileye, like they were just doing, you know, the, the signaling when someone would pass, it would blink and they, they kind of, uh, I wouldn't say pivot, I mean, that was a pivot for them because they didn't know what they would do with the technology once they, they created it, what, what's one of the companies that you know that had one of these groundbreaking, okay, we are doing this, but we, we didn't quite have the market fit, so we changed and then kind of hit our stride? Yeah. Um, I think one of the, it's an interesting story of a company that uh, invested in Coral Aspectiva, which uh, was, a, they, it was a very strong technological team that created this uh, very powerful NLP engine, uh, natural language processing engine, that actually can understand, um, they understand kind of text without, in an, in an automatic manner. So they can actually understand what the text is about without a human behind it, kind of an AI NLP engine. And uh, they came with this and they didn't really know what to do. And eventually they uh, wanted to focus on uh, reviews product reviews, so you can actually uh, uh, understand, you know, any product or, you know, room or whatever, in a hotel room or anything, they have like 10,000 reviews, 50,000 reviews, no, nobody can read, you know, 10,000 reviews, and it's just a long list. So what they thought of doing is actually um, subtract the different uh, aspects on, of the product, that's why it's called Aspectiva. So let's say if it's a computer or, an, uh, I don't know, a laptop, so you'd say, okay, how how good is the screen? How good is the battery? How uh, how you know how uh, the camera is it working well, etc. Or uh, if it's a trolley, if the trolley is good for for walking on the beach, or if it's a vacuum cleaner, does it fit uh, corners or does it vacuum uh, pets' hair? And this information doesn't exist. If you look, what is the best 
uh, vacuum cleaner for best hair, you wouldn't have this data because nobody actually positioned their vacuum cleaner as such. So originally they thought of coming with this uh, B2C approach, a uh, uh, business to consumer approach and come up with this uh, search engine that you would say, you know, the best X for Y, what is the best vacuum cleaner for pet's hair or something like that. Uh, and eventually we quite quickly, we understood that uh, the B2C approach wouldn't work because we need to invest a lot of, you know, educating the market and finding out and, and driving traffic, et cetera. So we kind of, it wasn't a whole, I wouldn't call it a pivot, but it's half a pivot. Um, we decided to go on a B2B approach and say, okay, if we can use this technology in order to increase the uh, sales of a, of a sales site or a hotel site uh, to increase the conversion rates, because I know better what to buy, uh, that would be a great thing. And that's what uh, eventually the company did. Um, they implemented this technology in a few um, e-commerce sites, whether it's a large hotel uh, 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 e-commerce site, um, a large um, e-commerce like product, and uh, they covered like hundreds of thousands of products like that. Uh, and, uh, and they actually showed uh, statistically that they did all this A-B testing that when you implement this uh, widget within the site, you actually increase your, your sales. Uh, so even if it's a hotel room, if I'm looking for a, I don't know, a hotel room for anniversary, or if I want something that uh, uh, is, uh, fits for a family, not, not necessarily you will have that in the reviews of the hotels. And, and when you can actually um, um, look at it from this different, a different aspect, it, it is uh, increasing the conversion rate. Uh, fast forward, the company did have its struggles. It didn't, you know, it took time to a little bit to fundraise and we had like any company are ups and downs, uh, but eventually it was sold to Walmart and it was the first purchase of Walmart in Israel and uh, we were very proud of that. Wow. I wanna talk about the fourth rule of chutzpah in the book. Before we do, I, want, I just wanna get an idea. What's, what's a typical, like, good success rate for, like, uh, not necessarily for Jerusalem Venture Partners, but for a good fund, what should be the success rate of that? And I'm not sure even how you measure success rate, if it's IPO or exit or whatever it is. You know, just to get an idea, when I think of baseball, you know, a Hall of Famer bats 300 means they get out seven times out of 10, right? So what's a good percentage for an investment fund? So in terms of, you know, multiples and IRR, usually it's, I would say multiple, you want to get three, four, sometimes you get more than that uh, on, on, on per dollar. But in terms of numbers, it's hard like to if say, a company, but, you know, like if a company invests in a hundred companies, what would be a success of, all right, so let's take uh, 10 companies. We'll make it easier. Okay. So let's say out of 10 companies, I would say, again, this is very high speaking. It's not uh, statistically uh, right. validated, but I think it reflects that. I would say that three probably would, wouldn't succeed. Three would kind of return the investment. Um, three would give a good multiple of anywhere between two to five. And one should be a home run or a fund returner, what we call. So yeah. that could be 30, 40. So uh, um, this home run is something uh, we call a home run, you know, talking about baseball. But uh, uh, it's something that usually you would like to have. Uh, you, you cannot plan it, really. But it's, if you look statistically at, at the successful funds, they usually have within a fund one company that actually returns the whole fund and more. And then the other company gives you the extra multiple. Uh, and so even though you can't plan it in advance and you don't know it in advance, which one would be the home run, uh, you, you do know that the investments that you make have the potential to be. So you usually wouldn't invest in a Me Too company or another X company that there's a lot of it and, uh, uh, and there's a clutter in the market, et cetera. You want companies that have the potential to become right. these category leaders or become a home run exit. And so... Uh, if you plan it correctly, I think more or less that would be a good yeah. return. Again, per head, you can invest in yeah. 30, 
but I mean, statistically, I would say more or less than you know. All of those have the potential to, uh, from the viewpoint of obviously the fund, they wouldn't invest it to be a home run. You know, just I just want to get that that sense because out of those ten, you know, there were a thousand that the company didn't invest in, right? Because for every hundred you invest in one, so there's a lot of companies and pitches you have to go through to find those 10 in it in itself you know True, but i would say that the ones first of all we don't always choose right obviously we made some <laughs> wrong choices and companies that never made it and we missed uh, some good opportunities that we thought that not not good ones and they uh, turned to be a success so it's not that uh, you know we don't yeah. have the monopoly of right of uh of smart uh, the sort of brains in the world by no means what was but, uh, we are we are trying to kind of mitigate risk by choosing the right ones yeah and maybe to also mention the fact that one fund said no it doesn't mean that it doesn't fit the other fund because sometimes we say no not because the company is not good because it doesn't necessarily fit our strategy it can be in a vertical that we don't understand in good enough it may be that it's maybe too late for our fund, maybe too early for our fund. So every fund has its kind of investment strategy. And so for every entrepreneur that goes to a, a venture capital to, for investment, they need to understand what the strategy is. And so yeah. try to get a good fit from the strategy to where you are in terms of the stages, in terms of the space, in terms of the hands-on approach or hands-off approach or whatever the strategy of the fund. Uh, it's it's uh, right. some of the no's are, some of the, or, or the negative, uh, the, the reason we kind of uh, refuse is not because the companies are not necessarily good, but it may not fit the strategy of the fund. Yeah. That was a good, that's a good point because it may not be a match. It may be like a groundbreaking food, a consumer goods product. You know, like we don't invest in consumer goods. We invest in technology. So, you know, go to someone else yeah. who specializes in that. Um, what, what sticks out to you as a missed opportunity that you go back, you're like, ooh, we, uh, the signs maybe were there, maybe they weren't, but we, going back, we yeah. um, wish we would have, uh, would have taken that one in. Yeah, um, there was a company uh, that uh, we looked at at the time uh, that did this uh, really cool uh, 3D uh, uh, kind of, um, how do you call it, when you rerun a, like a, a sports scene. Uh, and it gave this uh, 360 angle, uh, like in the Matrix, you know, the famous scene that you have is like the Matrix, around yeah. it. Yeah, and so uh, they've made a, a really cool technology. Uh, and uh, we looked at them. We weren't sure that the market is big enough. We weren't sure. But eventually they were so like after, I don't know, 12 or 18 months to Intel in a, in a, in a nice, <laughs> nice exit. We, said, oh, we should have done that. But, uh, but again, it's like uh, you, when you invest, you also have kind of a hypothesis. And we weren't sure that the broadcasting market was good enough or, yeah. or would pay enough for the kind of technology. So uh, it's kind of, a, I, I remember that as a kind of missed opportunity. Yeah. But, you know, that's, that's part of life. And by the way, any good fund will measure not only the successes, but uh, what we usually do, uh, and I'm doing it as an investor, we look at the companies we didn't invest in and kind of follow to see what happened with them. And so you kind of learn also from your own mistakes. Uh, and, and, and it's good to see this uh, uh, opportunities uh, or to look at the opportunities you missed because sometimes you actually can learn quite a lot from that. Yeah. No, I appreciate that because I like to see the thought process, right? Because you talked about people, team, market, product. And for that one, maybe you saw, well, is the market really big enough? And maybe even if all the rest of them were there, you'd be like, well, that one's not there and it's... If you just don't know, you can't put the money down, you know? Yeah, that was exactly the case. The team was good. The, the product was interesting. I mean, the nice technology. But the market, we thought it's a small market. It's a niche, you know. It's, a, it's also very, you know, not many uh, sports uh, kind of uh, broadcasting uh, channels. So if you, if you get it, you get a few. And if you're not, yeah. you don't have a market. So we were skeptical about it. But eventually, yeah. we bought them and, uh, and uh, proved us wrong. But, yeah. you know, I was very happy company and uh, and uh, yeah so there are these uh, kind of uh, stories that you, you say yeah we looked at but sometimes by the way you analyze the market in the right way and but still it's not necessarily within your strategy so you know if I don't know if you're not 
in the medical devices, you, you can analyze the market and say, yeah, there's a potential. We're not investing in medical devices, so we wouldn't, we'd probably not engage in these kind of companies. Yeah, I mean, I imagine sometimes that fuels the founder and be like, I'm going to show them. They didn't, they didn't think our market's big enough, blah, blah, blah. And we're going we're gonna to show them. And that maybe fuels them a little bit, the more no's they get to... to yeah, I mean, uh, that's, I'm, I'm happy for the ones who made it, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to prove that I was wrong and I made the wrong decision. <laughs> that's fine. And, uh, but you get, by the way, you get also other things that, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier to maybe give some kind of an input. I got some entrepreneurs that, you know, I met whatever, two years ago, three years ago, and uh, didn't make an investment. And then I meet them in some conference and they say, you know what, this meeting we had, we were talking about that. We took this route. It was great, you know, advice. And, you know, we really owe you this. And now we're doing great. And I'm, you know, more than happy to be kind of, uh, uh, to give my two cents to, to such companies. And that's also great. What was an advice? What was an example of that where you gave a piece of advice to someone and they came back and said, and maybe, you know, you do so, you probably meet with so many people, give so much advice, but to them that is, it was so meaningful for them. What was a company that came back and said, said that to you? And what was the advice you gave them? Um, there was, a, at the time, there was this ed tech company that uh, I wasn't sure. And, uh, and they were thinking uh, of going to small companies, to small, like small sites. It was a whole kind of bidding, bidding process uh, company. And, uh, um, and I told them they, and their strategy was all about to go to the long tail. And I told them that I actually don't think uh, they should go to the long tail, but rather go to the, you know, large companies and uh, because they have a uh, interesting technology that can actually uh, increase the, uh, the revenues. And, um, and they actually followed the survives and eventually they got some really big uh, kind of uh, uh, publishers. Uh, on their site, uh, on their technology. So uh, they came back and said, remember that? We changed our focus. We went, we left the long tail. We went to the uh, big guys and we managed to get them in the, you know, on yeah. our, our uh, so, uh, That's a big deal. That's a big change, you know, because if they're thinking, you know, when you're in your own bubble, or like that's all you're thinking. And so someone coming in from outside to tell you, you should focus on this, you know, really changes someone's yeah. course, you know? Right. Exactly. Um, so I want to talk about the fourth rule, the fourth rule of chutzpah. I mean, I, you know, like I said, everyone should check out the unstoppable startup, but the fourth rule when I was, you know, reading through it. Okay. The fourth rule is the market needs it. Even right. if it doesn't know it yet. And this is really right. hard sometimes for me to grapple with when you think of really innovators like Steve Jobs or, or Ford, right? If they asked, what they wanted, they want a faster horse, not a car. So this always sticks out and I feel like it's sometimes tough to give advice around. So I'd love for you to talk about the fourth rule of chutzpah. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned Steve Jobs. I think he's like, a, you know, the ultimate entrepreneur, so to speak, that kind of said, you know, the world needs a smartphone and he doesn't know it yet and he proved to everybody that he was right. Uh, and very similar with the iPod that he did uh, previous to that. Um, and even in Pixar, you know, with 3D animation. So he was kind of had this really exceptional sense of, you know, understanding the need before even the market knows it and kind of coming out with this product. Um, but I think that, um, you know, one of the examples I give in the book uh, is a company called uh, PixCal that eventually was sold to Getty Images. But they came with this concept that said, you know, people should be, uh, I mean, there's a lot of- uh, How do you spell uh, it? People are, PicScout, uh, P-I-C-S-C-O-U-T. Got it, PicScout, okay. Um, Eyal Gura is the founder and, and the entrepreneur behind it. And, uh, and they said, you know, we have this technology that can actually uh, look for infringements in, uh, in, in images in, on the web. So if you have a website and you're using an image without the copyrights, we can actually find out about it. And nobody, nobody thought that it's interesting, you know, said, you know, why do we need that? 
And uh, they had some struggle to actually uh, prove to, uh, starting with Getty Images, which I think was the largest uh, image bank in the world. And they said, well, there's not that much of infringement in the world. And, you know, it's a, it's a minor thing. Eventually, they went in, they, they kind of looked at it, looked at it from the uh, photographer's angle and said, you know, what? they're actually losing money because if they got the copyright, the photographers will get the money. And so eventually they proved to the world uh, that there is a need for that. And, and again, there was a nice exit uh, as a result, but the world didn't think that there were that many infringements and, and apparently there were. And there were a lot of money uh, that was lost in a way for photographers and to, to the people who actually did the work and uh, made these photo photographs. So in a way, sometimes you, and I think in many cases, startups need to have this hypothesis of where the market is going. Uh, what is it that you think will be different in the world in two, three, four years time? And I, I think now it's a great era to think in these matters because obviously the world is changing before our eyes. And uh, whether it's remote working, whether it's uh, telemedicine, whether it's educational uh, uh, technologies or, uh, you know, third, third party delivery, whatever. And the world is changing fast and kind of a good starter would say, okay, where the world is going, what would the world need? And the world can be consumers, it can be businesses, it can be uh, many things. Uh, and let's create it now before even the world is aware of that. So I'll give you another example, a company that we invested at the time called Navajo. And it was, it, they founded it just as the cloud was beginning. And everybody said, you know, enterprise would never put their data on the cloud because they, they'll be afraid, they wouldn't be protective. So Navajo came out with this um, um, security of the cloud uh, and uh, it was one of the first companies in the world that actually uh, made this encryption between when you're uploading the data and downloading the data. So even if you got somebody in the middle, a man in the middle stealing your data, it would, it would be encrypted. So um, uh, they thought about the need of these large uh, enterprises putting their data on the cloud and their fear of, of, of you know, uh, of their protecting the data. And they come out, came out with a solution. Again, fast forward a, a few years and they were sold to Salesforce because they kind of thought about a need that the market wasn't sure that, uh, that, I mean, many people said they would just, you know, they wouldn't put it on the cloud. They thought differently. They, they put it in the cloud, if it will be secure, let's make the security for that. So I think that any good startup will have a good hypothesis of where the world is going. Uh, it may be right, it may be wrong, but if it's right, you have to, it's like a, you know, these missiles that run after something in the air and then he hits it. It's a very similar thing, you know, coming, coming back to army metaphors. You have this, uh, you have this market with its ever-changing <laughs> moving target. And your right. missile is also moving a missile, trying to hit it. And, uh, but you need to have this hypothesis. And yeah. if you write the hypothesis and you have the eye on the ball all the time, it's a good chance that you, yeah. you'll hit it. In that case, we want an explosion of profits, not, uh, not deadly, exactly. something deadly. Um, first of all, I have two last questions. And first of all, thank you. Uh, I loved um, reading over the book and also just from your, your in the trenches experience, you know, just kind of bleeds through. And so I, I suggest anyone check out the Unstoppable Startup, um, you know, Mastering Israel's Secret Rules of Chutzpah and... Um, my two last questions, and where should we point people towards online to check it out? Um, I, I know they can, they can find it on Amazon. What other places online should we have people to go to? Just check out uh, the unstoppablestartup.com and there's a lot of uh, information about that, cool. about the book. And, uh, yeah. Check it out. I always ask since it's Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment you had to push through, challenging point, uh, career-wise or story-wise or investment-wise? And then what's been a proud moment for you? Um, I guess I, I, would, I would join the two uh, and maybe refer to one of the stories I, I told before uh, about this company, Aspectiva, I told you about. Uh, we got to a position when you are on a board of a company, uh, usually... Um, you have 30 days notice to give to the, uh, to the employees in case you don't have the capital 
Uh, so you, you, you have the capital to pay the last month. And so uh, when you give a notice, it means basically that the company's gone because nobody would buy a company without the employees. Uh, and with this company, we, we were very close to giving this notice. And, um, and, and by the way, if the company has some kind of a dialogue with an investor, you can come to the board and say, okay, let's wait with a notice because it may come, come in the next few days. And we have a very, very tight situation of, you know, either running out of uh, runway cash wise um, and uh, eventually literally in the, in the last second, uh, we had this uh, investor coming in. And uh, so the moment of, you know, we're, you know, we, truly believed in the company. We knew we had a good thing in our hand. We knew we had a good team and uh, it's a unique thing. And it was just uh, so frustrating to be so close and yet so far. Uh, but it, then, you know, it came through and that was great because it was like, you almost gave up and you should never give up. Uh, and then it was just, wow, we got not only the investment, but uh, relatively soon after that, we got this uh, offer from actually a few uh, large corporates and eventually we, we went along with uh, Walmart. So that was kind of a, a low and a high within the same roller coaster with the same startup. And, and uh, I think that uh, you probably have this with many startups uh, because, uh, you know, it is a roller coaster and you need to, make sure that you are aware of that and to push through all the way and um, you know never to give up hope that's very yeah. important uh, and make sure that you do everything within your power um, uh, to make to, you know to go through um, and you know very uh, and maybe last thing to say about that uh, be very very listen listen very careful to what the market has to say because you you shouldn't push it just because you believe in it you should push it because the market actually tells you it's, it's interesting and if the market tells you it's not interesting enough, listen carefully and make the changes, the tweaks, the pivot if needed uh, in order to have this you know, product market fit and not just go with your head against the wall. Um, so you have to be very musical, have a musical ear to the market um, and uh, make sure you make the right adjustment at the right time. Uri, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out the Unstoppable Startup. Check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. It was a real pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a peach. Like